Hey, everybody. How you doing? Well, that's good. You're listening to PHLY Flyers. That's right, PHLY. My name is Bill Matz. I'm your director of fun and games for the evening. And we have a full house today. Only one non-game day show this week. And we decided this was the day we had to get in our friends from Broad Street Hockey. So joining me is not only Philadelphia's number one beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor. I've taken out hockey. You're just the number one beat reporter. <laughs> sure. But from Broad Street Hockey, we have the fly by yourself, Kelly Henkel. Hello. And all the way down in Atlanta, Steph Licious D, Steph Driver. Hey, everyone. How's the weather up there? Chilly. It's starting to feel yeah. like fall a little bit. You know, I saw some leaves blowing across like my mm-hmm. lawn today. It's like it's, this is autumnal. This is what it's all about. Autumnal. It looks, autumnal. it looks as if it is Halloween Bro, outside. I didn't even know you knew that word. Autumnal. I know lots of words, Charlie. <laughs> right. I play stupid on this show for the entertainment of others, but actually I am a genius. It is, I heard it is you had gorgeous. This far, not weather. working very hard. <laughs> anyway. I heard it was gorgeous for your tailgate is what I heard. Uh, it was tremendous weather for the tailgate. I thanked everyone last night, but I have to thank everyone who came out to it. Uh, Kelly Henkel attended. We had some Broad Street hockey representation there. Charlie even had a beer on a work day. It was a uh, a single one. Uh, it was one it was it was a tremendous turnout. I was really happy with it. Dylan's duck was. Oh, exquisite. So good. And hot dogs. Uh, we, yeah, there were, the, there were the Costco hot dogs, too. <laughs> I like how he mixed the two. Like, we have exquisite French cooking as well as some roller hot dogs. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was a really great time. Uh, what has also been a great time to start the season is watching Flyers hockey. It has now, been bad. Just as now, the winds have uh, kind of dried up a little after the 3-1 and one start. They are now 4-4-1. Four, four and one. Hockey 500, as they call it, despite them having lost five and won four. They're somehow 500. Some would also say the losses aren't bad either. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's the losses for so many. many um, uh, we already had one comment or like right away as we were counting down. It was like, I want to see fun, exciting losses. And that is exactly well, I'm hopeful. Friend. Yeah, there it is from uh, I can't see that. Damn. <laughs> Daft dig it. Daft dig it. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> that's uh, that's blind. what we Good have Lord. seen thus far. So we just want to get everyone. We are now the first month of the season is down. This is the final day of October. Happy Halloween to all out there. Impressions of this team after the first month of the season. I want to lead it off with you, Steph. I don't know what this team is anymore. They just keep <laughs> bringing guys up and men are scoring that I've never heard of. Who is Garrett Hathaway? Who is that person? <laughs> Garnett Hathaway. Garnett, yeah. <laughs> My bad. Clearly, I don't know this. <laughs> They're man. big. That was the big off-season acquisition step. That's the big free agent signing. I can't believe I forgot about it. It's, I, uh, it I just good. don't know. I thought they were going to be terrible. This is not a terrible team. Not that we've been watching. No, they really aren't. And that's, I guess, the biggest, my biggest surprise, my biggest takeaway from this team is I don't know how good they are. They're probably still not like good. But they are far better than I expected. Oh, yeah. What's your impression of this team, Henkel? So they're not in the playoffs anymore like they were last time we talked. So I can't do my whole American Thanksgiving. They're in the playoffs. We're going to the Cup thing we still got anymore. We, we still got a few weeks. That's true. It's true. They, yeah, they could get weeks. back in there. They've fallen quite a bit, but that's okay. Um, I, I still think this team is better than a lot of people think they are. I still think that maybe – they could sneak into a wild card spot if so many things fall precisely their way. The eternal optimist. But no, yeah. we have seen when they do get a few calls, when they get a few bounces, when things go right and they the play bounces. their A game, they tend to win. Uh, yeah. Now, can things go their way for the majority of an 82 game season? Recent history says the fuck it can't. <laughs> Absolutely not. That's the thing. It's just a matter of time till we lose a guy to some thing you never heard of before. No, well, sure. yeah, he's got uh, his, his appendix exploded. Here he has appendix out. Oh, yeah, they put another, yeah, another one in one. and that yeah. one exploded. Rare like something appendix. like that will happen. Uh, Charlie, one month in, how do you feel? Well, I, I'm very happy that this team is no longer. Well, and. So far, so far, <laughs> they are no longer utterly painful to watch. That is good. They are fun. They do things. They're active. They try. They they work really, really hard. I think that's that's the key takeaway for from me from October is that man, this team works hard. And 
perhaps we should have expected that given the fact that it is John Tortorella. We, we are talking about a guy who it's basically like work hard or you will never see the ice and I will <laughs> confine you to uh, to a dungeon in, deep in the bowels of the Wells Fargo Center from whence Gritty came. Yes. But, but <laughs> they work Rubs really, flint. really hard. And what you see is they work hard enough to stay in it in games with really good teams. But at least so far, they're not good enough to take full advantage of that hard work and actually win a lot of games against these really good teams. So it's funny, you know, we we spent a lot of the first month of the year being kind of wrestling with this idea of our losses good, our wins bad, what, what, what actually should people be rooting for? And we come out at the end of October and the Flyers are sitting in a tie for the 10th worst points percentage in hockey, right. which in truth is not that far away from where people expected this team to be. Most people, I would say, projected this team to be kind of in that bottom five, six, seven. They're a little bit better than that. And yes, they're a little bit better that, than that, even accounting for the fact that they've played against a lot of really good teams. So maybe when the schedule eases up a bit, maybe they'll move up a little bit in the standings if they keep playing this well. But what we're seeing so far is a pretty fun, hardworking team that is still well out of a playoff spot, which is what the rebuild probably entails. So to me, this is about as good of a first month as you can hope for. I can, I will say though, uh, I can see this team. I mean, they work really hard. It's a Tortorella team. They might get into after this ridiculous schedule they've been through and they're going to, they got to go to, Bu they have a home and home with Buffalo. They have this West coast trip coming up next week. Mm. Like they have some tough games coming up when the schedule eases up. What if they fall into the Flyers' trap of playing down? <laughs> We're going to play down to the competition like maybe we saw against Anaheim. Anaheim might be a little better than we expected, but uh, they're, they're not very good either. Like, What if, like, oh, man, we held our own against Vegas. We beat Vancouver. We look really good against Edmonton. What if um, they're just like, yeah, man, Montreal on a Tuesday, that don't do it for me. <laughs> no, they're gonna <laughs> <laughs> They're going to do the other Flyers thing where they decide to make everyone on the other side of the fan base mad by going on a 10 game winning streak and absolutely destroying well, their But we do chance know at a top three pick. We do know 10 game winning streak means miss the playoffs. Fair enough. That's true. And 10 game losing streak means 50 50. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah it they, was they, back they to did. back seasons. Yeah. They were the first team ever to win 10 in a row and miss the playoffs. And maybe the first team ever to lose 10 in a row and make the play. It was something They're special. absolutely a asinine. Special group. Yeah. But that is just what the last decade of Flyers what hockey a, has what been. What a weird, weird hockey team. It's, they're, they're just... The they, they do nothing and yet somehow are constantly interesting. Yeah. Like, they, they, they've made no major shake-up signing. Like, they've done nothing of interest, but somehow... They're the most ridiculous team. <laughs> it, it's truly, truly amazing. You know what else is amazing, though, fam? Oh. It's hero bread. Uh, listen, hero I, bread. I think this time of year, uh, we could all use a little help making some better decisions. I know with football every Sunday, tons of hockey games, not to mention holiday parties. I was just at a Halloween party. I'm sure I'll be Ooh. doing something tonight. There's you know holiday stuff coming up. Everything else going on this time of year, I'm going to be taking in a lot of calories and a lot of carbs, specifically as a beverage. And now I'm told, <laughs> I'm told that that's not the best choice for maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Uh, but that's where Hero Bread comes in. Hero makes sliced breads, buns, and tortillas that are available on Hero.co and Amazon. Uh, I've been making a ton of quesadillas with the tortillas, uh, but all their products have hit the spot for me. This bread is soft, fluffy, and delicious. And right now, Hero Bread is offering the PHLY fam 10% off their first order. Just go to Hero.co and use code PHLY. That's code PHLY to save on Hero Bread today. Today. That's H E R O dot C O to save 10% today. I think I condensed that one perfectly the way I wrote it. Really? Um, so we got like the biggest surprises and disappointments. I think Steph really hit on it last, maybe last time we did this a show or two ago. Like the way they've looked against the quality of competition that they've played is the biggest surprise yes. to this point. Like they didn't get. First couple of minutes of the Carolina game last night, I was like, all right, this is the back-to-earth game. 
And then after like five, eight minutes, they looked like they've looked they pretty, basically all night. season. They played pretty yeah. even. With, now, five power plays to one, you're just going to have a ton of time where maybe Carolina doesn't get a chance to attack you the way they do. Also, they have three shorthanded goals this year. They didn't give one up, nope. so that's good. Uh, but I, I would say that, like that's maybe the biggest surprise to this point. What is every like the most pleasantly surprising thing, player, anything to this point? It's still Bobby Brink for me. Just a delightful ball of joy that young man is. He ripped a he ripped a shot last night. I was like, "Ooh, didn't know I didn't know you had that one in the bag of tricks." Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll see a little bit little bit more shooting, a little less playmaking out of Bobby. That Wouldn't would be fun. It. Yeah. I would say my I mean, and I've talked about individual players, but I'm going to go more on like an overarching theme here. I would say I'm most pleasantly surprised by the play of the blue line core as a whole. Because I went into the season thinking this defense had the potential to be among the worst in the league as a as a six man unit, and instead they're throwing Louis Belpedio out there on a nightly basis, and somehow they're he still holding teams person. relatively. Sp I mean, aside from that that Anaheim game, which I think in large part that was because Sam Harrison had a pretty poor game. You know but, how we say you get goalied sometimes. The Flyers got goalied by yeah. their own guy. <laughs> yeah, they did. Fair, <laughs> but I would say that. Beyond that game, and I guess the Ottawa game was just a, a clunker all around, the defense core, and part of this is team defense, the forwards are certainly helping them, but the defense core has done a good job of holding good teams down to a relatively reasonable offensive degree. And like part of this is Travis Sanheim being, so far, a strong number one. Cam York, we talked a little bit about him after the, uh, after the game last night, about how I think he's been good at even strength want to see more from him on the power play but i think he's been good at even strength in a in a top pair role sean walker's been a surprise he was a mole has been a pleasant surprise so far nick sealer got off to a little bit of a rough start but he's hanging in you know suddenly this team doesn't look like it's going to get completely destroyed you know the, the teams aren't going to dramatically ex exploit this back end which is what i was expecting so far, they're hanging in there. Now, whether they can keep it up, we'll see. Maybe eventually Travis Sanheim regresses a bit. Cam York starts to struggle. Sean Walker starts to look like the guy who they gave away in a salary dump. L.A. did. It's possible. But through a month, this blue line cord looks at the very least competent. And honestly, most, night, most nights, a lot better than that. I would say... I'm really looking forward to watching like Sean Walker. Maybe that's one of my, not my biggest surprise at this point, but that is a nice early feather in the cap for Danny yes. Briere. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're looking for confidence going into as this season progresses, and we're going to talk about some guys that probably need to be traded sooner than later, but it's, it's not going to happen all that soon. But like, you're going to probably not get high-end prospects. If it's more than picks, it's not going to be like prospect whose name you know. Like, you're going to get some guys maybe you haven't heard of or maybe you're not that familiar with. The fact that he hit on one of those types of dudes right away gives me a ton of confidence for what's going to happen later in the season. I do want to talk a little bit about disappointments, though, because... Cam York's been fine. I needed more than fine to start the year, though. Wanted to see him take another step. Uh, Steph, do you have any, like, real standout disappointments to this point? I actually don't, because I was expecting this team to be the worst team in the league. And I guess I'm most disappointed in myself for not seeing that maybe <laughs> there is some talent there. Like, I just can't, I can't trust my own judgment right now. <laughs> like, they're not bad. I can't wait to see them play the Sharks. Like, they're going to beat the shit out of the Sharks. Is, or don't is that going to be the game? I was yeah. going to say, don't, yeah. don't yeah. say that. Where we're loud. expecting them to win 4-1 and instead they lose 6-2. to two. That's mm -hmm. probably the one. Like, yeah, Felix Sandstrom gets back in. Oh, boy. Well, Felix Sandstrom yeah, is he's not, down on he's a not conditioning going to get back in. Well, he's down I on a conditioning yeah. stint. They didn't waive him yet. Uh, but I guess that's probably coming next. Um, well, no. So the conditioning stint, just to give some background, it was announced today that Felix Sandstrom is going down to the AHL on a conditioning stint. This is something that it can be done. It's it's allowed. The player has to accept it. They can't force a player to do a conditioning stint. Now, obviously, Felix Sandstrom hasn't played in the game. The closest he got into he got he got into getting into a game was he was a backup one time when they gave Carter Hart a full day off. He's now on a conditioning loan. He can be down there for 14 days without having to clear waivers. And this is just to get him some playing time. He hasn't played a game yet this year. Now, 
once those 14 games, 14 days are completed, will they waive him? I don't know. They haven't been willing to do it yet. So maybe they're just going to bring him right back up and keep this whole thing going because clearly they're scared to death that someone's going to claim him if they do waive him. But look, if, if Sandstrom's willing to do this, it's a good thing. Guy needs to play. At some point, they may need him, whether it's someone who gets hurt or whether it's someone who gets suspended or whatever. They may need Felix Sandstrom. So give him some playing time. And I, I it's, this is a good thing in general, but I don't necessarily think this means that once the conditioning loan is completed, that they're automatically going to waive him. They very well might bring him back up and stick with the three goalies thing again. Chances are they're going to need a third goalie at some point. Right. They don't want to lose him because, Jesus, what do you have behind Felix Sanchez? Well, they have Cal Peterson. Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I do. Exactly. You know, when, what was that, Steph? I said exactly. That's Cal yeah. Peterson. <laughs> That's just what adding, you have behind. adding her agreement to the <laughs> yes. let's not see Cal Peterson in a hockey game. Uh, but now it is time to talk about, man, the most discussed Philadelphia Flyer of the season. Mr. Morgan Frost, Everyone's number favorite. 48 in your programs, number one in all of our hearts. Well, he might be number 48 in yeah. John Tortorella's yeah, program. Well, <laughs> he, uh, he finally drew back into the lineup last night. I thought he made some standout plays. Does not end up on the score sheet, but, I mean, really gave himself plenty of opportunities yeah, to if a couple of guys finish. I mean, Tyson Forster in the slot. Uh, Travis Konechny had a look or two from Morgan Frost. There were some opportunities that he set up. I thought he helped out the power play, carrying the puck in a bit. I liked what I saw out of Morgan Frost. We discussed this on post game. If the plan was like we get him in one and we take him out again, then it's like, dude, trade That's him. That's crazy. Like, yeah. what are we doing here? Yeah. But it, it really needs to be he stays in. Do we expect him to stay in? I do. I, I we we asked John Tortorella after practice today because. Forget it might, it might have been Sam who asked him after the game and Torts gave him the huff answer of, I'm not going to talk about individual players after that game, Sam. But <laughs> then this morning, after he has a chance to watch the tape, you know, I'll go up and I'll be like, hey, now that you've had a chance to look at it and evaluate and sleep on it, what did you think of Morgan Frost's game? And he was complimentary. He said, you know, thought he got off to a little bit of a slow start, which makes sense. He hasn't played for 15 days. But I thought as the game progressed, he got sharper and sharper. And by the third period... I thought by the third period, Morgan Frost is one of the more effective players on the ice for the Flyers. Yeah. So in no way, shape, or form am I burying Morgan Frost here. I did think, though, and I put this in my, my story that's up on allphly.com. Check it out. I did think it was a classic example of a Morgan Frost game where you saw exactly what you wanted to see going in. If you're a Morgan Frost fan, you're pointing to all of the, look at all the plays he set up. Tyson Forrester, if he finishes on that, Morgan Frost has an assist. May, he drew a penalty. He did all these good things. His advanced metrics are good. If you're not a Morgan Frost fan, you're like, yeah, where are the points? Yeah, he turned the puck over. Power play went 0 for 5. You really thought he was going to fix it. So it's just one of those classic. Got dominated in the faceoff circle. Got dominated. Face so it's just, that was bad. It's one of those games where it's just a classic Morgan Frost showing where if you like him, you're like, yeah, he showed me everything I wanted to see from him. And if you don't like him, you're like, yeah, that's why he got scratched to begin with. And the debate continues endlessly. It's one game. It's, everything is just one game, Kelly. I know, Eagle's brain. Yeah, <laughs> Eagle's I brain. Get it. Yeah. I, Steph, just in terms of like what you think Morgan Frost is, do you think he's going to be a flyer in two years? Probably not. And I don't think that that's a big loss for us. He's he's just a guy. If he's not on this team, it's because there's more talented people that are pushing him out of the way. I agree with that. I would, however, like to see those more talented guys actually push him out yeah. before yeah. he gets pushed yeah, out. Yeah, that'd be great. Ryan Paling. I would agree yes. with that. I like Ryan yes. Paling a lot. This fourth line, if he's a part of it uh, down the line, cool. But, like, he's completely expendable. If he has to sit for a week so we can get Morgan Frost in there, he should. Yeah. The, and the fourth <laughs> like, line was objectively better last night. Well, it's almost like Scott Lawton's a better player than Ryan oh, Paling. Wild, wild <laughs> concept. Weird. I, just, I do like that, like, just off topic, but you brought up John Tortorella, how, like, after the game, he's, like, got to remind himself where we are. Like, God damn, I don't want to talk about moral victories. And then he gets to ask the question. He's like, I'm not talking about individual players. <laughs> After 1,474 games and another 120 in the playoffs, he still takes a game like that hard. 
Like, oh, God, we were right there with, like, maybe the best team in the East. And eh, just a little bit, just a little bit more, and we could have beat them. No, there, there's part of it where, you know, you can objectively take a step back. And and you can say the Flyers played pretty well. They had that. I would say the first period, the first I think it was the first fifteen minutes of that okay. period. I thought they got dramatically outplayed. Yeah, okay. Then Katuria makes a really nice pass to Tippett. Uh, Frederick Anderson gives up what I think was legitimately a weak goal. And then suddenly the rest of the period, the Flyers look legitimately really good. Second period, I would say it was probably like about 60, 40 Carolina. Then the third period, tie game. I thought the Flyers, they they lost that game in the third, but I thought they got the better of play in the third. Yeah. So you can objectively take a step back and say the Flyers really played one of the three or four best teams in hockey really tough. But God damn, is it still frustrating to, when you lose? And I think John Tortorella, you know, I kind of think back to um, to the uh, the television show Scrubs where it's the episode where um, where Dr. Cox like lets the, the the patients die because he makes the mistake. And then JD comes to like kind of pat him on the back. And he's like, the thing that I respect about you is after all this time, you still take it you so still hard. Take it so oh, damn that's hard. A great it's a great episode. And that there, there's an element like my lunch. Uh, honestly, honestly, John Tortorella, and Dr. Cox kind of have some similarities. They're both like angry, 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 <laughs> angry teacher. Yeah. Really wants to impart his wisdom on you, but also hates you a little. Yeah, a little he's going to give yeah. you a ton of shit in the process. <laughs> <laughs> I love Scrubs. Thank you for that reference, Charlie. Um, just in in terms of your your piece that you wrote on Morgan Frost, you should all read it at all phly.com. Charlie, I, I asked Steph this question, but you kind of threw it out there. Like, where does he fit in the long term plan? Do you see a fit for him? To me, and I put this in the piece, it's that I don't see a fit for what Morgan Frost is now. Because my viewpoint with Morgan Frost is this. Look, Sean Gattere looks like he's back, or at least back close enough that he's going to be part of He's not going to be an albatross. He's going to be Yeah, he's going to yeah. be part of this. Noah Cates, I think, is just a better all-around player than Morgan Frost. Now, Morgan Frost is a better scorer. I think Noah Cates is a better hockey player. And Noah Cates, to me, I look at him and I say, Noah Cates can be the third-line center on the next good Flyers team. But if Noah Cates is the third-line center on the next good Flyers team, I'm skeptical that Morgan Frost can, can be, be the 2C the on the next good Flyers team. So this version of Morgan Frost I don't think fits because I don't. they have so much talent on the wing and that's even without Mave Mitchkov, who is hopefully going to be over here in the next few years. I don't see where he fits. I don't see where a 40 to 50 point Morgan Frost fits. I do see where a 60 to 70 point Morgan Frost fits, which is why he should be in. Like he should be in because if Morgan Frost can take another significant step forward, if he can show that what he was over those 55 final games of the year was on a 60-point pace, if that's who he is, and he can be a 65-point-a-year guy, then suddenly I'm more open to it. But if we're looking at the sample size of the entire last season as a whole, and that was the guy who more or less showed up for the first two games of the year, then to me that's not a guy who they have to prioritize. I think Morgan Frost has to bang that door down. And I want them to to give him the opportunity to bang that door down, which is why I think he should be playing, which is why I think guys like Ryan Paling and guys like maybe Nick Delore, even though we can get into him in a little bit, he's looked good. You know, they shouldn't necessarily be prioritized over Morgan Frost. But I look at this situation and say, Cutter Gauthier's coming. Mavi yeah. Mitchkov's coming. Bobby Brink looks like Bobby Brink to me so far he looks like what I want Morgan Frost to be on a more regular basis. He That's brings the, that creativity. He brings that that can more consistent playmaking ability, and he has a, he plays with a little bit more of an edge th than Frost has shown. So to me, it's like if Frost wants to be part of this long term, he needs to. He can't. I think there are some teams where a 45-point-a-year Morgan Frost can be a perfectly useful third-line center. With the way this team is is slowly getting constructed and the pieces are starting to come into play, I don't think Morgan Frost can be that guy on this team. I think he needs to be better. I think he needs to be a, a 65, 70 point a year guy. Can he be that guy? Maybe. Certainly could. But he isn't yet. Yeah, and I know that Tortorella, I think I read in your story, Tortorella said like he is a center. Yes. And that's a big problem because if Torts views him as a center only, and now you've got Coots, Cutter Gauthier is coming, Noah Cates, 
he's not going to be your fourth line center. Exactly. So if he's a center, he does not fit on this team like full stop. I think, Which, there, I think there's a real fear, and I've, I've talked to people in the organization that have expressed this. I think there's a real fear that Frost, because of his tendency to kind of shy away from physical contact, that he'll struggle playing the high man on breakouts mm. at wing, that he's going to get overwhelmed by pinching defensemen and whatnot. Mm. Now, you could make the argument that okay. he could also get overwhelmed down low in the defensive I was zone. Say, but you want but, him down low, like yeah, but, defending but, but, power but, forward. But I think they just feel like he's more naturally, yeah. like he just has better instincts he's a puck down on the, low. He's a puck on yeah. the stick guy. Exactly, exactly. So I think that's the reason why they don't love him at wing. I think in the end, like this is what I'm saying about he has to bang the door down. Because if you give him this season at center and he does exactly what he did in the second half of last year, he finishes the season with 65 points, then suddenly he becomes a guy where he's he's productive enough where then it's on the coaches to figure out how the hell he fits. Then it's like, well, we got to try him at wing because – I need this guy in the lineup because I need a guy who can produce 70 points a year on this team for the future. If he's a 45 point a year guy, I don't think there's that same incentive. So here's the thing. We there's have- absolutely nothing in Morgan Frost's background or development that say that he could be a 70 point. Well, I mean, he, he, was he, a, a he did scorer. rack up a ton of points in juniors. Yeah. In junior, he was a In juniors, like- but he's been in the NHL for how many years now? Like he's, He's what he is. I just don't think that what you said about Noah Cates being the third line center, like that's, that's what I'm talking about. There are guys already on this team that are so much better than Frost. So here's like something interesting. Like we've talked a lot about these random pieces that Briere has brought in that could possibly be deadline bait for a team heading into the playoffs. Yeah. Guys like Stahl, Walker potentially. Couldn't Morgan Frost also be that like we don't I think that no one thinks of him that way because he's a young player and you don't really think of those kinds of guys as the rental type that gets moved at the deadline for picks but if he's not going to fit on this team maybe that is the move since he's on a short contract he does have talent if you're a team making a real push for the cup and you need some depth scoring like Morgan Frost is not a bad pickup for you know a second. I don't disagree. I don't know if he would get a second. I don't disagree with you, but the problem is, is that if you're going to do that, you got to play. You got to play. That's what I mean. You got to play. <laughs> and that's, that's really like, I-, I wanted to, like, how soon can they trade Cam Atkinson? Because so much of this issue, like, is solved by that. Are we sure that's going to, is that a thing? I, I'm not I think, sure it's going to happen. I don't gonna, know. I, I, I don't know. It's possible. It but should be a thing. This, this is the same reason why people bring up why did they trade Scott Law in the offseason. And that, that was another piece of what I was going to say, but just, Listen, this fourth line, whether it's with Paling or last night with Lawton, has been effective. It has. It, they've been good. Like, I, I, listen, I didn't, I didn't, the Garnet Hathaway signing made zero sense to me. We've all been critical of, listen, I love Delorier. He's one of my favorite players on the team, but like signing him for four years on a team that's no good is like, okay. With a no move. I guess that's a choice, you know? <laughs> like we've all thought that these things were odd. And then you bring in Ryan Paling. It's like, oh, the dude who couldn't play for the Penguins is good enough to play for, okay, sure. All right, uh, for our live listeners, live viewers, sorry about that little tech issue, but we were just discussing the fourth line. We are back now. And I'm just like wondering, like uh, so much of the fourth line uh, we've been critical of, but they're good. Yeah. So it's, well, it's working, but how important is it that it's working? We know they want to compete every night. They don't want to tank all that. But when it comes to, Hey, we want Brink Forster and Frost in the lineup every night. Is that not more important than having this like identity energy line? Like, in the if we're gonna rank what means more this season, is that not more important than like well Ryan Paling and this line give us our identity? So I I, I think yeah like the, the, the isn't development this of clearly young, more important yeah, than that. No, the development of the young players is obviously more important. That said, I do think that having an identity, having culture, like it matters. Otherwise, you would just tank, and they're clearly not tanking. I I think. What, what what I will say is that the roster and the lineup that they showed last night shows that they can have it both ways if they really want to. I was just going to gonna say, like, because, why yeah. can't Lawton on the fourth line still be a fourth line that gives you some identity and toughness or whatever you want it to be? Because you've still got Delorier out there. It's not like and you're that's why that. the Hathaway thing has bothered me from the beginning. 
Like it's just a log jam at a spot that they didn't need one. I mean, he's been good. all that happened. He's been great. He's been yeah, fine. He's a good player. Scored last night. I, I'm, he's not a bad player. That's the problem. That if he just so stunk good. and you could sit him, that would be cool. Yeah. But he doesn't. He's no. effective. <laughs> that Deloria Fake guy. shift. Here's one thing I will say about Hathaway. And this is something actually, because we interviewed him after the game last night. He was one of the guys we got in the locker room. And this kind of hit me after the interview. And I don't want to I don't want to run with this too much because I don't know how I don't know what his personality is like in the room in terms of interacting with players. They might be completely different people, these two guys. But talking with Garnet Hathaway, the guy who he reminds me the most in terms of interviewing, it's Matt Niskanen. He reminds me a lot of Niskanen, just that steadiness. He seems to really take a long view of things. He's kind of that he, he gives off kind of this like calming presence and he's good. And I almost wonder if that's because look, the last time this Flyers team was good. Now, granted, part of that was because Matt Niskanen was also a top pair defenseman. But I almost wonder if they they feel like that presence is important to have in the room between periods, at practices, things like that. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe that, from a personality standpoint, that's some of the value they saw in Hathaway, aside from the fact that he's a legitimately good fourth liner. Maybe I'm crazy. But I just remember the feeling I got interviewing Niskanen and the feeling I got interviewing Hathaway. And it's just there were there were a lot of similarities. So I don't know. I, I do think a lot of this plays into the culture element. They think Garnet Hathaway, number one, is a guy that can help them build the culture they want to build to maybe have this rebuild not take quite as long as it would otherwise. And then also they think this is a guy that, hey, we still need to keep the fans happy who are showing up to the games because we don't want to lose all of our season ticket holders. We want to keep people happy. And Garnet Hathaway is an entertaining player for those people in the stands. But I think it was a little bit of both. Even if you take him out, like which of these talented young forwards that you're trying to develop are you going to push down? Like are you putting Atkinson on the fourth That's line? just Lawton. That's Lawton yeah, but, to but, me. But, but Lawton it's, has one spot. His, his one spot now he's taking Paling's spot. But that's, that's now. I'm just like in the grand scheme of building the roster in the off season. Okay. Like yeah. you could have penciled Lawton into four C or four R W yeah. and avoided this entire log jam. But as we've pointed out, none of us thought Bobby Brink was making this team out of camp. They couldn't, I guess, have foreseen such a thing after what they saw out of him last season. And maybe they also couldn't have foreseen that no one up front was going to get hurt for the first time in like five years. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's getting real jinxy in here. I don't like it. It's getting real jinxy in here. <laughs> uh, uh, just one more thing on, uh, well, I guess this kind of leads to the next conversation. Um, like, I look at how the game played out last night, and Tippett has that critical icing that was, like, completely asinine. Yeah, it was bad. Not and good. Noah Cates, this dude who we've seen log big minutes, he uh, played more against Edmonton than Sean Couturier did. Uh, we saw a lot out of Noah Cates last year, and they're leaning on him heavily this year. Big turnover that led to the game yeah. to the go ahead and eventually game losing goal. Now, sure, like it kind of gets to the deposit and withdrawal conversation that we have all the time. And yeah, Cates and Tippett absolutely made a ton of deposits last year. You're not going to take them out after one mistake. But didn't Morgan Frost make a ton of deposits last year too? Like, is it just that? Is it just the coach's bias yep. or is it something I'm missing? I don't think Morgan Frost is going to be a star. I don't, it's not the biggest problem in the world to me if he sits sometimes. But just in terms of what this season's about, sitting him six times in a row is like, what are we doing here? No, it's, I, like, it, is it just the coach doesn't like him? Is that all this comes down to? Go ahead, Steph. Yeah, so I think this season uh, is really about reconnecting with the fans, which is why the fourth line looks the way that it does, which is why they're still playing the kids. But Morgan Frost is not the point of this season. Like, he's just a guy. And I think, yeah, I think it's exactly that. Tortorella doesn't like him, so he's going the way of Kevin Hayes. Yeah, we talked about this before, that I think when John Tortorella decides he doesn't like you, and you're the you're the guy this season that he's going to ride harder than anybody else. I don't know that you get out of it. Like it doesn't seem like he lets them out of that. Well, I mean, 
I do think it's harder. But I think what you are seeing, especially the, the guy I'm going to note here is Travis Sanheim, that you can get out of Tortorella's doghouse. Now, granted, part of that might have been like, hey, John, we got no defense. We, we, can't, we can't trade him. <laughs> Listen, He's got a no trade yeah. clause now. Like we're stuck with him. You better figure out how to work with and him. Also, like, that might have been part of it. Who else is going to be your number one defenseman if it's not Travis Sanheim? <laughs> like, Risto, Risto, who started And out also... <laughs> Also, they tried to trade him like really badly. Yeah. It was almost they, done. Yeah, they just they just couldn't because Tory Krug wanted yeah. to stay in St. Louis. I just and play play for the note. Like yeah. the I, note. Uh, they talk about that. It was we we had this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I can't get sidetracked. So yeah. I, I just I see a guy, and I get it, Steph. He you think he might be just a guy, but when I see a 23-year-old who in his first full NHL season, like and a lot of this, like, yes, he had opportunities at full seasons, yeah. but would get hurt, get hurt and yeah. got, like, whatever. But it's his first full NHL season, scored 46 points, 19 goals. That's a good That's first good. season. Like, that is good. I would like to see that built upon. And if not, if you're not going to afford him the opportunity it, it, because we have to keep the fourth line together, that's a failure of of that's an organizational failure to me. Yeah. Like, and it's not again, this isn't going to sink the rebuild. It's not like we've probably spent more time than we <laughs> need to on on fucking Morgan Frost. So much but time. it's just like isn't like if the point of the season isn't figuring out what these types of dudes are and there's more urgency to me with a Morgan Frost cuz he is 24 yeah. like it's shit or get off the pot with him yeah. like Cam York we have time Bobby Brink we have time Morgan Frost this is it this is this is your season we're going to sit him six times in a row I, I think that's it's, foolish I think it's dumb like I I think that that's really the best way for me to yeah. put it. like I think it's, it's just not the best I way think to go it's about dumb it. on a lot of levels however the reason why I can't, and this goes back to something you said a few minutes ago, the reason why I find it hard to work up a ton of righteous anger, which is, I think, where I differ from the people who have found it easy to work up a ton of righteous anger. They're is, already mad. Well, <laughs> yes. But also, like, I personally, and this is, again, just my opinion, because a lot of this I'm going by the eye test. Some stats as well, but a lot of this by the eye, the eye test. test. I don't know how you could have watched last season and thought Morgan Frost played as well as Owen Tippett and Noah Cates. I oh, think, no, I don't I, believe I, I, that. I, but, but, but I think there are a lot of people who think that it's like, oh, the three of them, they were around the same. Like, I think Owen Tippett took over games. Yes. Morgan Frost almost, like, almost never did. I think Noah Cates drove play and was a legitimate five-on-five. Like, when Morgan Frost isn't scoring, he's not driving play. He's not doing anything. He's a points guy, which is why my view of points guys like that, who are going to be around the 35th percentile in terms of play driving impact, they got to score shitload of points. They got to have that like, three quarters of a point yeah, or more. They like, can't be like a tra half a point. Travis Konechny is not a play driver. I've accepted that because Travis Konechny was a point per game guy he last year. He scored 30 goals I in can 60 live, games. I like, can live with that's that. That's a huge number. <laughs> exactly. That's a half a goal a game is like Austin Matthews shit. Yes. I watched Noah Tip, no, Owen Tippett, and I, say, I said to myself, this is a guy who's physically dominant who can take over games. I watched Noah Cates, and I said, this is a guy who I can stick on my third line in a cup contender, and he can play secondary shutdown minutes, chip in with points, and do all the little things. I watched Morin Frost, and I was like, yeah, he showed some offensive stuff. Hopefully next year he scores enough to make up for the the obvious weaknesses in his game that make it so just because he's a 45-point guy doesn't tell me that like that's enough for him to be absolutely part of this. But this goes back to why I think it was dumb that they scratched him for six games. Yes. Because I want to give him the opportunity. Like, let's just let's just find out. If if we if you gave him 82 games this year and he finishes with 42 points again, then at least you know. But now, like, if, if you're going to play this game where you're sitting him all the time, all it's going to do is, is turn him into, you know, like, a, a talking point for the people who think the Flyers are stupid that, see, look at how stupid you're being with these guys. Like, let's just— Wild let, Brink and Forster play every night. Let's, let's just see. Yeah. And if he's not that guy, if he's just a 45-point guy, then, then okay. Then we know. But so, let's just see. Charlie, in your article, I, there was kind of like a throwaway line about— how they're not entertaining the idea of trading Frost. Not yet. Even to teams that called. Like, have yeah. there been calls? I on mean, this is what happens in the NHL. Like, when a guy gets scratched for six games, opposing GMs might just shoot a guy a text and be like, hey, you know, hey, Danny, like, 
if if you're interested in trading Morgan Frost, like let us know. It's like a fantasy football league. Like, okay. hey, like I see your team is <laughs> one in seven. If you're thinking about <laughs> trading, let me know. I might be interested in Joe Burrow. Okay, fair like enough. that's just how it goes. And like in that situation, when he's sat for two weeks, I'm calling up and going. You uh, looking to give him away for free? Yeah, right. Like I'm yeah. definitely not. You, you up, Danny? Like <laughs> this is this is a 500 team, and the dude ain't playing for you. Clearly, you don't think much of him, right? So I'm not gonna Which give you anything. Like, hey, sitting. you want yeah. a couple of sevenths? Like, <laughs> like that's what I'm like thinking about there. So yeah, we're not entertaining the idea of trading him right now because everyone's trying to steal him from us. Like I, I can very much understand that, but looking down the line. Like, if they get a solid commitment from Cutter Gauthier in February, right before the trade deadline, and he's like, oh, no, when the season's over, I'm coming. Yeah. You you consider it. Like, I wouldn't do it before then because someone has to play. Uh, But but he hasn't yet. So, But (laughs) I'm just like, if you get that commitment from him where it's like, oh, yeah, in a month after the Frozen Four or whatever – uh, I'll be there. It's like, all right, well, now we need to clear up. We need to make some room for a dude who is definitely going to be a part of the future. I would absolutely at that point consider trading Morgan Frost. But as of right now, no, because I don't I don't know what he's worth. Just play him. I just play him play and him. find out. That's like if he like stinks, he stinks. It. But like yeah, let's find it. out. You know what doesn't stink though? What's that, Phil? It's the uh it's it's the Soul Savvy Drops app. Don't miss out on the biggest sneaker drops and download the Soul Savvy Drops app. The drops by Soul Savvy. Wow. Drops. <laughs> the drops voice. by Soul Savvy app <laughs> makes it easy to keep up with the latest news, releases, raffles, and sales in the sneaker world. It is the, your one stop shop for everything sneakers. Drop alerts, instant notifications. You will never miss a release again. You'll get instantly notified whenever your size is available to buy. There's a uh, raffle management, a free raffle management. Uh, tracker. You can keep track of all the raffles that happen in sneakers with our raffle tracker. Uh, there's a release calendar. Accurate releases uh, will come to you updated on releases that are coming in the near future. Whether you're a casual buyer or an all-out sneakerhead, Soul Savvy is something for you with three different levels. The basic version, mobile plus or premium, and the drop. We have a drop alert for you right now. This is a little preview of what you get with the app. This Saturday, November 4th, the Air Jordan 1 reimagined royal drops. The drops by Soul Savvy will notify you when and where it's dropping. Download the app and never miss a release. Sign up for Soul Savvy by clicking the links in the description below or by visiting links.soulsavvy.com slash P-H-L-Y or head over to the App Store and download the Drops by Soul Savvy app. There was a lot of the word drops and release in there. Mm, you drop. Drop. Mm. <laughs> You've been on a big Beastie Boys reference that. kick recently. I can't hear drop said with like – with actual gusto and not think that song so we talked we've talked morgan frost basically to death at this point i'm sure Um, have no (laughs) uh i want to get into a couple other guys i brought up owen tippett and noah cates a minute ago and they made some mistakes last night Uh, tippett also had a goal charlie called it a weak goal by freddie anderson i would say look at his numbers they've all been weak goals came in with an 865 (laughs) last night i'm pretty sure 865 is the hockey reference baseline for really bad starts it's like 870 or 865 like if you had that in a game it's a really bad start like so that was his season average coming in yikes and he played pretty damn well but did give up a Week one, uh, tip it like it, he was due. He was going to score. Good, like he was going to score at some point. That's Had how it to. went in. But what do you make of? I, I want to especially talk about Noah Cates to this point. I don't want to say he's been a disappointment, but I feel like he hasn't taken a step necessarily. No, I haven't really seen I- anything out of him that has been, I guess, remarkable. Like, Charlie talked about how last year he was a guy that you really noticed as kind of like the baby couturier on the team. And this year he's he's been fine. But I guess I would have hoped, and it's only been, it's not been that many games, so it's a little early to like start condemning these guys. But 
I would have liked to see him, as you said, take a little bit of a step forward, just be a little bit more than he was last season. And maybe he doesn't need to be, but I also don't think he's met the standard of last season yet either. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree say? with Kelly. Go ahead, Steph. And yeah. sorry, and I also, I also don't think that he's going to be the the big numbers on the score sheet kind of guy. Like that's just not who he's going to be. So if that's like that's the type of game that he's going to have to develop, and that that'll come with time. But I think exactly what Kelly said. He's been non remarkable, unremarkable, which is not bad. It's just not good either. Yeah, I think the hope on the Flyers' part was that he was going to take a step forward offensively. And I don't think we've seen that yet. I think that's really what's going on here. And this is the, we've compared him so much to Sean Couturier. This was the never ending discussion with Couturier. He had that 2016 season where it was like, oh, yeah, he's scoring. And then he got hurt. So like the raw numbers weren't great. And then finally he really broke out uh, as a scoring threat. But it took a while to get there. Yeah, I I mean, I think he's got four points in nine games. I think you're probably hoping for a couple more points here and there. I don't think anybody expects Noah Case to be a point-per-game guy. That's not him. He's just, you know, you look at his numbers in college. A guy who scores, you know, 25 points in 40 games and I think is like junior year, like probably not going to be a point-per-game guy in the pros. Doesn't happen. But what I will say is that I do think that you guys are maybe underrating his play a little bit in terms of what he's doing away from the puck. Now, granted, I know I'm coming off of a game where he was the guy who made the turnover, so that's obviously clouding things. That was a bad play. It was a bad play. As John Torrell said this morning, no one knew he screwed up immediately. Like, he's not one of those guys I have to go and tell him he messed up. He knows. But what I will say is that you look at the underlying numbers for the season for Noah Cates, when he's been on the ice at 5-on-5 per per Evolving Hockey's expected goals model, the Flyers have collected 61.09% of the expected goals. That's second best on the Flyers among forwards behind only our pal Joel Farabee. The Flyers are controlling play with Noah Cates on the ice. And to me, like, and again, this is my bias. I'm going to be biased in favor of guys like Cates who drive play and maybe don't score as much as other people wish in fi- over guys like Frost who maybe score a little bit more, but the team gets outshot now chance when they're on the ice. That's my personal bias. And I'm not saying sense. everybody has to look at it like that. That's the way I look at it. So to me, Cates is doing exactly what he needs to do in terms of two way play. I'd love to see a little bit more offensively because I want to see him take that step, but I'm not disappointed with him. And when it comes to play drivers, I guess it would be if Bobby Brink, while he's created a ton of chances and looked really good, like it, if he and maybe Farabee had finished a couple more of these, it's like, all right, now we see the full skill set of the line. Oh, we have this great creator in Bobby Brink. We have this really good finisher in Farabee. How do they get there? How do they get to where they need to score? Well, yeah, that's Noah Cates. He does that Sean Couturier-like work to get you into the offensive zone, and then your more skilled dudes finish off the shift by scoring. If we saw a little bit more out of them, not even Kate, like Kate's gets secondary assists or some yeah. tipping goals or whatever, but even if it wasn't him on the score sheet, but those two doing a little more, mm. maybe he'd be like st- you both said unremarkable. Maybe he'd be, we'd think of him a little no, higher. Cause it would be like, look, he's plus 12, right. like, or, you know, or like, like something like that. that goal yeah. happen kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah. Exactly. And he, and, and, Cates is plus two. No, he that is. That line yes. is outscoring yeah. the opposition. They are. And they've looked good. It's just with the amount of chances they've created, maybe they could have a couple more goals and then everybody's numbers look good. But you got like Joel Farabee. Joel Farabee's got six points in nine games, yeah. four goals. Brink has six points in eight games. So it's not like the production isn't there. I've liked that line. I've liked what I've seen from Cates. Could, could he do more? Yes. He could do more offensively. I'd like to see him be like I would say for most of the players on the team, I like to see him be doing a little bit more on the power play if he's getting those minutes. But at five on five, I'm relatively happy with what I've seen from him. And speaking of the power play. Yeah, we got to talk about it. I want to talk about Cam York a little bit. Okay. We can get into the power play issues with Cam York. Why? um, I, I talked about like Noah Cates not having taken a step. I just need more out of Cam York. Like I need him to be creating the way I said with about Travis Sanheim for years. Like I understand what he brings to the team, but if 
He's not putting up points. I can't think of him in a higher in the highest possible regard of what his skill set is. I need Cam York to be more dynamic. I think like of all their defensemen, he is the most likely to be the guy who can do that thing on the power play. We have not seen it to this point. Again, nine games, not a huge sample. We know that Charlie, his baseline is 10, so we're not there yet. One more. Need that one more. But I just haven't seen enough out of Cam York yet. He's been fine. I need more than fine out of a dude that I think is going to be one of my top four defensemen on the next great team trademark. So here's the thing that I want to talk about with the power play, because we started this show talking about bounces. Aren't, Charles, the underlying numbers for the power play pretty good? That is a good question. I'm fairly I sure they are. I'm not going to pretend that I knew this. My, Kurt from Broad Street my assumption account. was that they weren't. I believe they are. But let me take a look. I Let's... think they've been like the last couple of games. They've definitely generated more chances. It so, hasn't looked as bad. They're not, they're not great. They are. The Flyers rank 29th in expected goals per 60 on the power play. And they rank 32nd in shot attempts per 60 on the power play. Mm-hmm. So no, pretty bad. I thought last oh, night that's, was a uh, great example. Yeah, that's... It's saying that's pretty bad. Pretty it's bad. It's not, not, not good. No. I thought last night was a great example of like what they lack on the power play because like they need to make the extra pass. They need to oh, do... Last night specifically. They, were good. they need to do so many extra things in order to make the power play work. And you know who you're not going to make the extra pass against? Carolina, because there ain't no room. Not like, like it was a great example of what's missing here. Like in order for this to work, we need bounces and we need to make the extra pass. We need to just have that. And no, against a team that plays defense like that, it's not going to be there. And it simply was not. That said, man, Morgan Frost that close to threading that needle. We had that Frost had a really good pass to Forrester. Yeah, and, the and slow, Forrester yeah. just didn't finish. Just didn't yeah. finish. Like yeah. that that was Frost did everything. That was the, he one had of the best on offensive play. plays of the game. It yeah. was a tremendous pass. And it just I, I remember when that play happened and when Forrester got stopped, and I just like I winced. Because it was just like, damn, like both, bo- of, you. both, both, both of those yes. guys needed that play yes. so bad. Both Frost needed to be like, look at what I did in my first game back at a really nice power play assist. And Forrester just needs a freaking goal. Yes. Like desperately. And you're just like, God damn it, Tyson. You couldn't just elevate that a little bit more. More to, yeah. to, to change the narratives around t- not just you but the guy who passed you that puck like ugh, so close but back to york tell me why i'm wrong about him i i, I don't think you are yeah i i think i think we're, we're in agreement here like i don't think you're That's wrong nailed it like I don't, I don't think you're right. Like, let's get that clear. I need it on the record. I don't think you're right. But I also don't think you're wrong. He's, he's young. Like, this is all I can say about him. He's young. He's been put into a position where it, it might be a little bit past his scope right now. But, like, he hasn't done anything commendable with it. But he also like he screwed up enough times. I'm I'm on your side. I I get the thing that he's young and he can grow into the role. This is a really fucking young league, though. Like I see yeah. guys his age and younger yeah. doing awesome stuff, and it's not as if he is a Quinn Hughes. Like, like no one thinks no, that. No, no one's no. expecting that out of him. So it, like it might be an unfair compare, but I just see dudes in their early twenties. At all positions, all over the league, doing awesome shit, and he's not one of them. He's not, and maybe he's not going to be. I, I think, and I hinted at this on the post game last night. This is the perfect year for them to figure out what they have in Cam York, and I think, I think they know what they have in Cam York is a good top four defenseman. I think they know he is going to be a piece that he can be a piece for this team for the future. But this is the year where you can throw him in a top pair role. And this is a year where you can turn him into your power play one quarterback and your your guy on PP1 who gets the most minutes up top. And you find out, can he do it? And if he can, great. Now you know. 
now you know that you don't necessarily need to go prioritize. You know, when, when you're when you're scouting defensemen in the draft, when you're scouting top 10 defensemen, you know that if it's a tie between one guy who's a little bit more offensively oriented and one guy who's a little bit more defensively oriented, and you think they're about as equally good, maybe if Cam York can be a power play one guy, you pick the defensively oriented guy. Maybe if he can't, you pick the offensively oriented guy. Like, this is a good year to figure out what you have in York because you know you have... I'm fairly confident they have a good defenseman. They're putting him in situations where, as Steph said, maybe it's a little bit beyond his capabilities now. Maybe it's a little bit beyond his capabilities forever. But at least now you're giving him the shot. And this is what this year should be. You're giving him the shot to show if he can handle it. If he can't handle it, that's good information for you to have moving forward. I don't think it's the... If he... If he doesn't excel in power play one minute, if he doesn't excel in top pair minutes, I don't think your takeaway is, well, Cam York sucks. I think your takeaway is He's not Cam York isn't a top pair power play one defenseman, mm-hmm. and then you can make future decisions based on that knowledge. That said, we're nine games into the year. I'm not willing to say yet that he is. he definitely can't be a power play one guy, that he definitely can't be a top pair defenseman. I think he's actually shown me more on the top pair defenseman side where I'm like, hey, maybe he could be a 2-3. On the power play side, I'm I'm much more skeptical that he's ever going to be that that Cam McHale McCarr type guy. But I'm willing to give him the rest of the year to see what he can do. You know, we're we're talking a lot about the Flyers and their planning, you know, years in advance, way ahead of time. But you never have to do that because the game time exi- the game time app exists. Listen, buying tickets Flawless. to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee. You can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. Game time is the place for last minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section or row for less. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference. So snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code PHLY for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code PHLY for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And listen, if you're looking for something to wear to the game after you buy them tickets, with game time. Maybe you go to FOCO, just saying, because FOCO has the absolute best officially licensed gear for all sports and fandoms. Whether you're looking for team apparel for the season ahead, overalls, hoodies, hats, sunglasses, bags, anything you need for game day, Maybe you're looking for some accessories, toys, collectibles, or novelty items for your man cave, she shed, or podcast set. You've got to use FOCO for all your team gear needs. FOCO always has our back for Philly sports, and they have yours too. Get the best gear around by using the link in our description. And for all non-presale items, use promo code PHLY for 10% off. All right, uh, only a couple, you know, a little bit of time left here. Is there anyone else on this roster who you think has stuck out one way or the other through these nine games that deserves uh, some sort of comment? You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take the plunge here because I think he deserves it. Honestly, Uh-oh. I think Nick Delorier has been good. There I it think is. He's, I think he's been good. I don't think I don't the necessarily fucking numbers nerd himself. I don't think he's going to necessarily continue to be this good, <laughs> but. I think that so far he has impressed me. What if they've unlocked something? Dude, that shift last night? That was the shift. It was <laughs> his did it. shift. He yes. has supplanted Mike Richards. It was all a right, great yeah, shift. All right, that was down. an awesome shift. It was Come a on. great shift. It was not the shift. It was no, William. pretty Definitely damn not the shift. impressive it was is all a good I'm shift. saying. But no, he's he's got good underlying numbers. He's passing my eye test. I think Tortorella said by their internal metrics after five games, uh, and I think the next couple he he regressed. He wasn't the, that line, that fourth line kind of fell off a bit before they 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 scratched paling. But I think through five games, they had Delore with the second most scoring chances of any of the fours on the team. Like he's not playing All right. bad. All right. I think he's having a great season. Whoever is keeping track of these scoring <laughs> chances is huffing glue. <laughs> <laughs> No way. He only plays like nine minutes a night. There's no way he's got the second most scoring chance. <laughs> I'm just saying he's had a pretty good start. Oh, I'm, I'm, and and, and I, think, is, well, I, I think I think he's to been me, very good. What really frustrates me and like 
I'm saying this for someone who is very much a stat person, love the numbers, really think they have value. But if you can't take a step back when a player who, generally speaking, doesn't perform well by the numbers, performs well by the numbers and the eye test for a two, three week period, and you can't take a step back and acknowledge that he's actually playing well, then you're the bad version of a numbers person. Because you are so blinded by what you think should happen that you're not actually watching what is actually happening in front of you. And again, I expect that probably by the beginning of December, Nick Delure won't be playing that well because I don't think Nick Delure is a great five-on-five player. But right now, I think he's playing pretty well, and I'm going to say it. Love I, that for you. I mean, I couldn't put it any better myself. What a personal journey. Quite Charlie. honestly. <laughs> Uh, do we have anything else? I think we need to wrap up. Steph, who you got? Any, any surprises? I was just going to say, my dude is Carter Hart. Like, he, we, we knew that he's good, but there's always been questions. Our dude has been really good, and he deserves, he deserves some recognition for that. I'd agree. Yeah, he's off to a good start. 921 save percentage. Obviously, the Hockey Canada stuff is a, is a, is a cloud over everything. Blooming but, nonsense. but, purely always. on the ice, he's been real good. I got to tell you, and GMs around the league take note, Cam Atkinson, baby. How many yeah. goals does he have? I think he's at five or six. Not bad. Call he's Danny. looking Amazing. real, real good. I would say just giving up one first round pick for Cam <laughs> Atkinson would be a steal at this point. Scoop him up. All he's right. Gone. Uh, I believe that is all the time we have for you on PHLY this week. The time just flies when the four of us are together. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for hanging out. If you haven't already, you got to follow us everywhere. Twitter, uh, YouTube, podcasts, allphly.com. Become a diehard member. All that stuff. Make sure you're reading Broad Street Hockey as well. My name is Bill Matz for Steph Driver, for Kelly Hinkle, for Charlie O'Connor. Have a great week, Philly. We all silly like the mayor.